1655 in my Bible, but first Peter, and I want you to start, uh, if you will, kick off the service this morning uh, with these verses from this particular chapter, and we'll continue with the uh, focus verses later on here in just a few moments. Are you ready? Are you ready to hear from God today? Amen. Uh, Amen. Would you lift your hands towards heaven and say, Father God? Uh, right now, I'm setting all my other thoughts aside because I'm attending <coughs> to you. My ears are open to hear your word. My heart is ready to receive your word. The Lord send your spirit that my mind might comprehend what you're saying to us today. And Lord, we pray today, Lord, for the man servant that he would do your word no harm. Father, thank you today for your anointing. Thank you today, God, for your covering. That we would do the word no harm and God, that the word would go forward and do that which it has been sent to do in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Beginning in verse 3, listen to this. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Somebody give the Lord a clap of praise right there. There's a reservation for you, amen? Listen, there's a reservation for you, and it's it's going to be higher than any any skyscraper. It's going to be better than any earthly suite. It's a heavenly mansion. Can you say amen? amen. I don't know about you, but I heard somebody the other day once again say, I would be happy with a pop check, not me. I want all that God's got to give me. Somebody say amen. Amen. Listen to what he says now. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved for you in heaven, who are kept, kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed for the last time. 
In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, say a little while, a little while. if need be, mm -mm -mm, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith be more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, who having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible, full of glory. Hallelujah. Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation for your souls. Oh, Jesus, thank you for delivering to us that promise of salvation for our souls. Thank you, God, that there is still yet a promise to be fulfilled if we hold on to our, our listen, if we hold on to our practice and to our belief of faith. We're believing up on you, Jesus. Lord, that you would anoint us today to respond according to that promise that you have given to us, to that presence that you have given to us, to that power that is manifest in us right now. The Holy Spirit testify today. You are sealed. Hallelujah. You are sealed. And it is a sign of God in your life. Would you stand right now as a sign of God's revelation in your life? Let's worship this morning. Oh, 
thing that we could bring to you today is our attention. Our focus on you. The more we so desire so many things in life, but nothing compares to having you in our lives. Lord, we don't want to we don't want to speak of you as when we speak of the, the Kardashians or the wealthy of the world and wishing we were one of them. No, Lord. Neither do we want to sit and wish that we were one of yours, knowing that we have this promise of, from a God who cannot lie. And Lord, you sent your son. You sent your son. Father, today help us because, Father, I understand that much of religion focuses on what we're doing so wrong that would condemn us to hell. But God, today we need to look at the balance of things of, of grace uh, and how grace, uh, it, it focuses on what Jesus did that was right to reconcile us unto himself. Lord, let us be able to focus on that today as we sit quietly, as we worship. In these few moments, let us soak in your presence. Let us experience that. Let us experience what the Bible calls joy inexpressible and full of glory. It's not always about the hoop and the holler and the, and the goosebumps and the running and the jumping. Sometimes it's in the quietness. It's in that stillness. It's in that peace that you have given to us. <coughs> Right now, Lord, I'm a man with, with, my, with the manservant to my right and his wife and Lord, the others that are here this morning that say, Lord, you have given us a moment of peace. And for that, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for what your son has done on the cross. And may we be able to <coughs> express that to the world at large. Yeah. Be still. There is a healer. His love is deeper than the sea. His mercy is unfailing. His arms a fortress for the weak. Let faith arise. Let faith arise.
There is a river that flows from Calvary's stream, a fountain full of thirsty. His grace that washes over me, let faith arise. I want to ask if the ushers would uh, prepare to receive the offering this morning. And, uh, we're not through worshiping. I'm going to be glad for live worship. Amen. 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 Live. Hold on. Brother Mike, do you like live worship? Or do you like playing alone? Well, come on now. Some of us, you need to understand what I'm telling you right now. I'm reading from that song. Some of us need to be reminded. We need to go back, and I'll hit this again. I've been preaching this over the last few weeks. What David said. Restore the joy of my salvation. Yes. So, uh, so Mike, go ahead and have a seat. Let, relax. Okay. Thank you for your efforts, but I got the feeling somebody needs what God's bringing Amen. to bear today. I mean, and then we think about this. Uh, how is it that we, some of us, that we, we grow cold, that we, we lost the joy of our salvation? And then sometimes we're thinking we're wanting something else that we believe we should always have for salvation. Did you know, brother, that if you come to Jesus, all your problems are gone? Somebody say lies, lies, oh, lies. Lies, lies. 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 I, I'm, hoping to, I'm hoping to spell out some things today that will, will encourage some of you. Um, uh, are the ushers up yet? They're still sitting. Um, I, I, want, I want to encourage some of you today. Uh, there's a few things that we've been called to do on a regular basis, and that will come up in the message today as well. You might want to take some notes because many of us we need to be, and we need these notes. You need how many of you need reminders? Yes. Sir. How many of you when you went to school you had you were reminded you needed a pencil? Yes. Okay. <laughs> some of you might even need to remember, remember you know, remember to wear your shoes and well wait a minute, that may go back a few years, but um, <laughs> Brother Ed, would you pray? All right. Oh thank you for the dedication. Yes, Lord. Bless all the people in the house today. Take up the cross and have a beautiful day with them. Jesus Christ, I want that. Amen, amen. I want to help some of us out because um, there are some things.
that we really don't know how to process. And I understand uh, some of us get it, and, and those of you who get it, you know what I'm talking about, because it seems like some of us still don't get it. You know, the Bible tells us that we are, we, we are to show compassion to those who need compassion. Amen? To your left, Brother Harold. Um, <laughs> it also tells you, tells you you need to, you need to have your eyes open, be vigilant. Um, but my, I, I want to kind of get to this this morning because I, I, uh, the thought came to my mind a while ago, actually even today, and I, I made the comment as I was praying. Many of us were focusing on this religious, the religious aspect of our faith whereby we focus on the things that we do, the bad things that we do, that will condemn us to hell. Just so you know, most of you get a pretty good, high, a pretty high grade on being able to tell people what will condemn them to hell. But we have a very low grade on grace. Now, here's the thing. Out of the abundance of the heart, now somebody just, and, and just, I've gone through, a, a, I'm still going through a bit of a season because someone, someone will, will, will want to fire back on me, but here's the deal. If all I preach to you is grace, but I don't preach to you judgment. If I don't preach the judgment of God, what does grace have to do with anything? Because what we want to make grace out for is something that it's not. It's not a free ticket to paradise. Amen. Back to bags and leave tonight. No. It's, it's, not a, it's not a free ticket, you know, you know, you know, you know <laughs> wait, some of us you understand, you understand this. There's no free ticket. Everything that you everything that you have. <laughs> Not only has it been provided for you, but it's been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus. Amen. So we need to remember what grace focuses on. I don't want to hit that hard today. We want to focus on what Jesus did right to reconcile you and me unto him. And he is and one, of, one of the parting statements he makes, he, he, he encourages them as, as he's making his way out of the out of the picture in the world, essentially, the man. He said, listen, remain in me and I'll remain in you. I mean, all these things will come to pass. And then, listen, and you can do nothing apart from him. Of course, many of us are doing a lot of stuff apart from him. How's that working for you? Let me kind of preface this because I want to talk to you this morning a little bit about a longing. Some of you are longing for something. And some, some eternal security people won't want to hear what I'm about to say. Because you totally, you are totally distracted and totally believe you can live your life any way you want to, and you're saved. To which I say, I'm not to judge, but I'll tell you this much. If you're not living like one who's been redeemed, if you're not living a life that God's called you to, if you're living not according to his plan, his purpose, we have been studying and here for the last few weeks in the book of Numbers. God has a plan and a purpose, and how many know he's, there's an order to things? He's a God of order. But here's the problem we have. Some of us, we want it to be an order of our preference. We want it to make us feel a certain way. I, I, I can tell you over the last month, and I can, I can speak names to some of you here who've gone through some things, and it wasn't exactly pleasant. But you're here today... And you're hearing me today, and you've come through to today for me to tell you that God is greater than whatever you've gone through. And the reason that you've been able to go through is because he went with you. Amen. I, I want to bring a different perspective so you can see how I see things. Because, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I want you to remember that for a moment because I'm going through the valley of the shadow of death. But here in a little while, I hope to be able to illustrate to you what's casting a shadow in that veil. Are you with me? I remember, uh, it's, it's been years ago now, when I went to, uh, well, we, we went to, I can remember going to my first pro ball game. I can remember going to my first professional hockey game. I can remember going to my first, uh, I'll call it a professional concert. Um, and let me tell you, though, those experiences were great. Amen. Brother Mike was telling me a story of when he went and he saw the Eagles. Well, how great was that, Brother Mike? Like, wow, right? Uh, you know, I, wait, wait. You're not, not too many years ago in, in LaPorte, Indiana. Uh, who did we see? Who's the country singer? Willie Nelson. Willie Nelson. You know, the guy was like 100 years old, right? <laughs> but, man, it was great. It was a great experience. I mean, country music and all that good I mean, but it was a great experience. It was exhilarating. And you know, how many of us, we get exhilarated like that when we come to the church? I got one. 
Well, maybe it's two, because I... Give me a... Come on, how many want to be accelerated this morning? Yeah. Just so you know, I'm going to do my best, but without the Holy Ghost, my best ain't good enough. My point is, I went to these things, and, and even though those, those experiences were absolutely incredible, it, it, they were absolutely stupendous, it fails in comparison to knowing Jesus Christ personally. Amen. No stadium, no concert hall can compete with salvation, because victory over a team is nothing like victory over sin. Recently, as we were teaching recently, we, we, we read in James, and we're told that trials are meant to fortify our faith if we remember that they are temporary. Trials are meant to fortify our, our faith if we remember that they are temporary, they are timely. They might be terrible and transformative. Here Peter starts his letter with a reminder that we are strangers in the earth, sojourners. You know that song, I'm just, I'm just passing through. Amen. I, we, we're, just, we're, not, we're just passing through. And then he establishes what is ours in heaven. This is the promise. And he talks about the trials and, and how he, he's back to the theme of salvation. I mean, it's easy to lose perspective when going through problems, when going through trials, when a spirit's in heartache, so Peter gets our eyes back on that which it matters eternally, not just temporally. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10, 11, and 12. Got to get up on the screen. Looks something like this. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched <coughs> diligently. Amen. In other words, they searched it carefully. Who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or in what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us they were ministering <laughs> The things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things which angels desire to look into. Things which angels desire to look into. I wonder how many of us have lost our desire. I'm gonna, if you've gone through a season maybe where you went a little bit cold, you weren't. You weren't in your Bible, you weren't praying, you weren't in church, you weren't in fellowship, you went through a dark time, you went through a dark space, it was cold, and you lost your fire. You see, what we find here is, in the scripture, is that this has been going on, and first, salvation is predicted by the prophets. Amen? Amen. We see that at least five things that the prophets have given props for. First, they diligently studied salvation. Look at verse 10. Of this salvation, the prophets had inquired and searched carefully, diligently. They studied it. They didn't just, hey, look, uh, I heard something about this, you know, salvation. Cool. And then they go on, no. Today, are you still not interested in studying about salvation? Are you still not in interested or even concerned about maintaining that relationship? When you drop down to the first part of verse 11 where it says it's searching. Now, if I look at these words, that implies an, an intensity, if you will. Uh, and and they, it was used like, like a miner that's in there and he's digging and he's digging. What's he digging for? He's digging for gold. That's what miners do. Silver and gold. And we just sang the song. And how many of you know that his love is more precious than silver, more precious than gold? Amen. So is our salvation. Or, or of a dog that's trying to sniff out something with its nose. The prophets pondered and they diligently explored, investigating carefully in order to understand everything that they and the other prophets had already predicted. Now, probably the clearest example that I have found as I studied this past week was in the book of Daniel, chapter 2, 
when Daniel studied what Jeremiah had written to determine how long the exile was going to last. Have you ever gone through a trial? Have you ever had things for you and say, okay, uh, how long is this going to last for me? Anybody here? Right. Maybe you're going through some stuff right now. Just, how long is this pain going to last? How long is this hunger going to last? How long am I going to be alone? How, or how, many, how long do I have to bear with these people? You know, that's what Moses complained about. Yeah. And God said, listen, I gave them to you. They're yours. You're going to bear with them until you're done. Amen? Amen. It ain't over until it's over. And so we see this, and, 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 and he says, I, Daniel, understood the books, the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Can you imagine when he realized 70 years, most of us are going to be gone? I want you to hang on to that. Hang on to that thought. Hang on to the idea. What are you leaving behind? What kind of a, 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 a legacy are you leaving? You know, the scripture, and I'll hit it again later on, but the scriptures talk about how we're supposed to live, leave an inheritance to our grandchildren. But what about the generation that comes immediately to follow, that, that follows our kids, for instance? Raise up a child in the way that they should go. If you refuse to raise your children the way that, that they should go, it will be upon you. It will be a curse unto your soul. Amen? So, if the prophet studied salvation, then so should we. If the prophets of God study salvation, Hebrews chapter 11 says this, he is a rewarder of those who diligently, diligently seek him. Yes. Well, you know, I, uh, I, I spent a lot of years on Sunday school. Um, I don't think I need that anymore. I've been in church. I've been pretty regular. My whole life I've been in church, and I've read the Bible. Wait, can I tell you there's a big difference between just doing those things and studying the Scriptures? And I want you today to make this note. I want you today to be like the Thessalonians. I want you to, to start studying to see if what the man of God, this man, is telling you right now is true. Because you need to hear the truth. Like I said, there are going to be those that say, well, you know, you talk about religious, uh, the, the, this religious practice that, that tells you all about all the things that you've done wrong that condemns you to hell. But you're going to find out that I preach both. You need to know that you need a Savior. Somebody say amen. Amen. I need one. All God's children amen. still need to be saved. You need a Savior. And we need to study how to live and to walk according to his principles and practice. You see, their prophecies dealt with a, a coming grace. This is the Old Testament prophets. It was a grace that was coming. And look at the last part of verse 10. Who prophesied of the grace that would come. Prophesied of the grace that would. It has not yet come. The prophets knew that there was no prophet in rule keeping. We're trying to earn one's way to heaven. Because salvation, as we know today, is by grace and grace alone. Not of works some of you are still boasting, so you might want to stop. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. But can you boast in your salvation? Yeah, if I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast in, in the grace of God. I'm going to boast in the works of Jesus on the cross. Not by works that I've done, but what he did on the cross. That's why I need us standing here today. Amen. And that's why some of you are still sitting here living and breathing today. Amen. Because of the grace of God. Not just because you listen to your doctors, and you should. Not just because you listen to your parents, and you should. Some of your parents wanted to kick you out long before, but they let you live. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Here's the deal. They, the prophets of old, were trying to figure out who Christ was and when he was going to come. You know, we're still doing that today. I wonder if the Antichrist is here. I wonder when the end times are going to come. Here's the deal. The Bible plainly tells us it is not for us to know. So why do you want to study? Why do you want to spend your wheels and spend your time trying to figure out when, it, when the end is coming? When we're told we're not going to know. Specifically, it's spelled out. Can you take that as truth today? Amen. So now we need to do, we need to live like today is a day of salvation. Because there's, there's, a, there's a night coming when no one shall work. Amen. But today is a day of salvation. So they tried to figure out who it was going to be, when he was going to come. The prophets, all the way from Moses to Malachi, they knew. They knew that God was going to send a Savior, but they didn't know who he would be, and they didn't know when he was coming. Look in verse 11 with me right now. Take a look there. 
Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating. When's he coming? What's he going to look like? Who's he going to be? And some of you who've been on our midweeks, we've been studying numbers. How many of you enjoyed this study of book of numbers? I got to tell you, it's, it's restored something in me. Uh, a passion to do what I'm telling you right now. To study your salvation. The Bible says to study, to show yourself approved. And some of us think, well, you know, I read my Bible once in a while. No, study to show yourself approved. Study about salvation. Study about redemption. Study about these things that God wants in us. Amen? Amen. But in Numbers chapter 24, which was a few weeks ago, uh, it, it talked about the prophecies that spoke of, of a person who was coming in the future, but they didn't include a specific timeline. Listen to this. Verse, uh, Numbers 24, verse 17. I see him, but not here and now. I perceive him, but far in the distant future. A star will rise from Jacob. A scepter will emerge from Israel. They knew somebody was coming. They knew, in a sense, where he was going to come from. They knew the line he was going to be born in. They knew he was coming. They didn't know when. So are you aware of this? I'll give you a statistic. There are over 300 specific predicate predictions about the coming of Christ in the Old Testament. Over 300 predictions. Let me give you a list of the 10 that I thought were a life up to this. Uh, if you've been in Sunday school, we're doing a study on, on Isaiah. And it's, I'll tell you what, I was looking over that paper today. I, I think I'm not going to miss class next week. Amen. <laughs> um, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, it said that he would be born of a virgin. In Micah chapter 5, verse, verse 2, it said that he would be born where? Bethlehem. And in Zechariah 9 and 9, it said he would enter in Jerusalem on, the, on, on, the, on, on a donkey. Somebody say amen. In Zechariah 11 and 12, it said that he would be sold for 30 pieces of silver. Back again in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, it said that he would be wounded and bruised. In Psalm 22, verse 16, it says that his hands and his feet would be pierced. And going back again to Isaiah 53, verse 12, that he would be crucified with thieves. Again, back to Psalms 22, verse 18, that his garments would be torn apart and that lots would be cast forth. And then in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, his side would be pierced. Psalm 16 and 10, one of my favorites, that he would raise from the dead. Hallelujah. And then it, 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 it's fascinating to me in the book of Romans, Romans 9, beginning in, in Romans 9, Paul quotes that, that, uh, more than 20 Old Testament texts from nine Old Testament books. Here's what he says in those, in those writings. They knew that Christ would suffer first and glory would follow. What would happen? Christ will suffer first. What follows? Glory. Say, well, glory. 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 I'm looking for that. Amen. Yeah. Somehow, these messengers of God, they learned. They learned from the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, that suffering would be involved before victory would come. Verse 11. When he testified before him the suffering of Christ and the glories that would follow. You know, they didn't understand everything about everything that they knew. But they somehow saw in the distance. Here it is. Ready for this? Two mountain peaks. Remember the valley of the shadow of death? Two mountain peaks. Listen to me. One mountain was the Mount of Calvary. Where we find out in Isaiah 53 and 5 that Jesus would suffer. The other mountain is the Mount of Olives. Where he's going to return in glory, Zechariah 14 and 4. Can you see the two mountain tops? Can you see the two peaks? And here's what I'm telling you right now. We are living in the shadow of those two mountains. Yea, though I walk to the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear to leave white because he's with me. I'm, listen, I'm in the shadow of the Almighty. I'm in the shadow of these two peaks. One where he suffered, the other where he's going to return. Can you say amen? Amen. And I'm going to walk in the knowledge of that amen. all the days of my life. Can, I, can you do that with me? What they didn't know was that there was going to be a long valley and a lot of time in between those two peaks. That's where we are. We're in that timeline between the peaks. You see, the, the, two, the, 
disciples on the road to Emmaus. You remember that story? Two disciples walking on that road to Emmaus. And they ended up having a post-resurrection Bible study with Jesus. Now, you hear what I'm telling you? When he brought these two themes of suffering and glory together in Luke chapter 24, verses 25 and 26, it says, Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? If you go back and you study the scripture, you'll find that they were, they were, they were a little bit confused and they were talking about, well, what's happened and what should have happened. This, this should have happened. That should have happened. Get this. They were mourning the death of Jesus. And whenever you go through tough times, you're going to start questioning things, even including your own salvation, even including whether God even loves you or not. Even Are you getting this this morning? Am I the only one that ever questions these things? I'm not the only one. Friends, can we talk? If Jesus had to go through suffering before entering into glory, why in the world do you think he shouldn't? Amen. If he had to go through suffering before entering into glory, I believe that we too will, will need to go through some garbage before we get to glory. What did Paul say about this? So, now, he hadn't finished his race yet, but he said before Christ, everything was what? Garbage. Well, he said something more. He said it was garbage. <laughs> he counted everything as loss. But do you know Paul's suffering wasn't over yet, was it? Let me tell you what was over for Paul. Let, listen to this. I want you to hang on to this. The needless suffering was over. Everything before Christ, if he suffers anything now from here on out, if you, listen, if you are walking with Jesus, anything you suffer now, what did he say? He says, in this you greatly rejoice, though for now a little while, if indeed you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold, that perishes, though it be tested by fire, may be found in praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Is it not going to be worth it? To have your faith tested. Faith not tested is not faith at all. It's wishful thinking. You see, we do have to go through some glory or some garbage roll before we can get to that glory. They knew that their prophecies were for a future generation when they, when they spoke. We see in verse 12 it says, To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering. Get this. The prophets of long ago were ministering to those of us who haven't even arrived yet. Are you listening? Do you want to know why you need to be in, in, in Sunday school, why you need to be studying your Bible and all that? I'm telling you right now because you need to read what the prophets have to say. Because they are trying to minister to us the promises of God. Amen. So they didn't receive what they knew that, that, that they had given their lives to. Matter of fact, in Hebrews chapter 11, it says a lot of them, they weren't, they weren't holding the glory and never having received the promise. But they believed anyway. So it was accounted then as what? Faith and righteousness. So that now, guess what? Your faith is accounted to God. Your faith is accounted as righteousness. And it's not your own righteousness. It's the righteousness of God and Christ that's in you. Through faith, you were saved. Amen? Amen. So we need to live in light of our legacy, don't we? Amen. We were given a promise by people of old. They never knew us. They were never going to meet us inside of glory. Yet they, they were sharing with us. As we get older, it's going to be important to think about what we can pass on to our next generation. How are you doing with that? I mean, think about that. I mentioned earlier there were going to be some things I'd share with you. Look, write this down. I don't think it's in your bulletin because it came to me this morning. Let me tell you what we're called to do in Christ as we walk in our faith. We are called to gather, we are called to grow, we are called to give, and we are called to go. You know that's what we do in our organized services. Amen. When we gather together. We gather, we grow, we give, then we go. If you skip out on those first three, you really aren't, you can't go, you're not equipped. 
You've not, you've not been empowered. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? Did you know that we are to be the sent ones? Well, where are you going to be sent? Out of the imagine of, you know, the imagination of your mind, or from the word and the will of God, from the fellowship of saints. <coughs> Proverbs thirteen verse twenty two says this: A good man leaves an inheritance to his grandchildren. But as I read that, and I'm talking to you today, I still have to share with you. There's a sense of where we also need to be thinking about what we can leave for the immediate generation that's coming behind us. What can we leave for the next generation here at church? What are you going to leave? You see, this helps us, I think, when, when we uh, think that we'd like to see a ministry flourish or something to happen. How many of you would like to see your church grow? Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, more than just having the pews filled, that's great Amen. too. But in order to do that, there's some things that need to be done. You know, before we start any ministry campaigns, I mean, I was looking over the pamphlet, and some of the things that we were involved in years ago were not involved in it now. Why? Because the people have lost their purpose, they've lost their vision, and without vision, people what? Perish. Perish. Well, yeah, when I'm saved, eternally I'm saved. Yeah, but you've walked away from your calling in God. You see, we give, we can only give what we've been given. Amen. Knowing that we might not ever see the fruit of what we give. Some of us, you understand what I'm telling you. I mean, my wife and I have had several decades now. Brother Mike is Commander, and, and uh, Brother Lane, who's with us now, he's got a, a few years under his belt. You don't really know. Am I going, watch this, am I really going to get a return on my investment? That's not for you to decide. I'm just going to give as we pray that Lord that you would bring the increase. Amen. <clears throat> you know, our life is just a loan anyway. Isn't it? Amen. And when we come to Jesus, we actually get a new lease. It doesn't expire, by the way. That is that is biblical return of security. That new lease doesn't expire. But did you know if you violate the lease, what happens? You get evicted. Hello? Salvation, then, was predicted by these prophets. And secondly, salvation was proclaimed by the apostles. So we see this in, in this next part in verse 12. It says, let me see if I make sure it comes up. Here we go. <clears throat> Listen to this. The things which now have been reported to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Now, we, we can see a couple things here. That they did. They preached the gospel and they did it in the power of the Holy Spirit. Brother Mike said he sensed the presence of God this morning. I'm telling you, I, since I got here this morning at 6 o'clock, that's all I have felt the whole time I've been here. And it hasn't changed, not even a minute. As a matter of fact, I'm burning up up here. Amen. Not just, no, the AC is on, but I'm burning up anyway. Amen. 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 It's, it's a fire from the inside. Just so you know, I don't want anybody to turn up the AC so I can cool down. I want, this is nothing else. I want the burst into flames up here. Amen? Yes. So here we have, we see these things here. They, they preached the gospel. They did it under the power of the Holy Spirit. And get this, Peter knew all about that because that's what happened when he preached on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And what happened when he preached on Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost? 3,000 people were added to the church. 3,000 people, 3,000 souls were saved. The church then spread across the Roman Empire and ultimately has spread to the ends of the earth. I, I was listening to uh, uh, one of the, Billy Graham's, uh, uh, I don't know, I guess it's his organization, he was speaking about this. He says, we're at a time in history right now where there's almost no place on the face of the planet that the gospel is not being preached. And he says, and we're still looking for the place that it hasn't been preached yet. Because that's where we're going to go next. How many of you know that's what needs to happen? You know, he doesn't have to travel far. If I can pick up the phone and say, hey, have you checked your old backyard? I mean, have you checked your neighbors lately? Are you checking in your own community? Are you checking your kids? I mean, wait, listen to what I'm telling you this morning. Are you preaching the gospel to every, everybody everywhere? So what I'm not a preacher. Okay, so go with us. Did you know what will happen when you start witnessing? You're going to preach a while. You might preach and use words. You might just use your actions. 
So when the gospel is preached and the Holy Spirit empowers, here's what happens. When the Holy Spirit empowers us, incredible things happen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit. We can also see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power. And that's why we need to do and what we need to do to get you to do it right. A.W. Tozer said this, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what, it, what we do would go on and nobody would ever know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop and everybody would know the difference. Did you hear what I'm telling you? Yes. I wonder, I wonder if we would notice that the Holy Spirit were not at work here. Brother Mike, I just tell you straight up, never apologize when you feel the presence of God. Amen. And we need to tell other people, because I'm here to tell you, 95% of us don't even know that we're in his presence. Salvation was predicted by the prophets, preached by the apostles. And there's one more stunning aspect of salvation. This is a big one. Some of you may have not heard it preached or even thought or even talked about lately. Predicted by the prophets, proclaimed by the apostles, but get this, prized by angels. I still today hear a lot of folks talking about angels. There's a lot of fascination. There's almost a culture out there that is absolutely just totally overwhelmed with the idea of angels. But did you know that those angels are fascinated by us? Amen. Yes. And we can see that very in this very phrase, listen to this verse 12. Things which angels desire to look into. I want you to think, just consider that word desire. Because that's a strong word. Anytime you see that preach, it, it, you know, mentioned in the Bible, I desire, Paul said, I desire to come to you. Yeah, he really wanted to come to those people, but he was withheld. You know, there's, there's so many times you find out what these desires are about. It's a strong word. It means to long after. To have a passionate, intense desire, a want. Jesus used that word in Luke 12, 22, 15. It says, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Notice that. With fervent desire, I desired. A little bit of impact there, right? How bad did he want to eat with them before he suffered? Pretty bad. So take a look, and to, to take a look into refers to standing. I mean, I, I think about this, you know, as if they're standing on tiptoes, trying to see what's going on. Standing on tiptoes to see if somebody famous was maybe stooping down in order to take a look at something. I mean, figuratively, it means to inspect curiously in order to see something exactly. Have you ever had to do this before? It is you. How about this? You're out there, you've lost your child. There's a big crowd. You're looking for your child. I think that's, I, wait, I'm going to go back to years ago. Ashley was, I don't know, probably eight years old. And we had gone to Michigan Adventure. Or no, yeah, was it in, in Muskegon, is that right? And they had this big, humongous water slide. Well, they had a small one and a big one. We lost our daughter. We're looking around. Where is she gone? I'm scanning around. I've got, I've got a camera with me with a telescop, telescopic lens, so I start scanning through the crowds. And I'm scanning around and scanning around and I scan up and say, oh my God. Then he says, what? 
I, and then I, I, took, I, I, took, I took my sunglasses off. And I, is that her up there? She was on the tallest slide. She'll tell you about that story. Because she remembers it quite well. Because she was up there all by herself. She got them, she broke free from mom and dad. And they almost weren't going to let her slide because mom and dad weren't there. But boy, was, she had a great time. But she said she'd never do that again. <laughs> <laughs> My point is, if we are intently looking, if we are trying to see really what's going on, and that's the same word that was used when John stooped into the tomb earlier in John chapter 20, verse 5. It says, and he, stooping down and looking in, he's trying, he's trying to peer into the darkness, the, the dark pit, the dark tomb, to see, is he really gone? Mary did the same thing in, in chapter 11. That, that word is the present tense, meaning that the angels, listen, the angels continuously watch and they're continuously inspecting. Did you know there's angels watching over us right now? Amen. Amen. Yes. And I wonder what they're thinking right now. I wonder, I wonder right now, are they cheering on the preacher this morning? I wonder right now, are they trying to somehow find a way to get to you to encourage you to say, listen to what the man of God's saying this morning. Listen, desire to, desire to hear what God has to say today and what he's done and what he's going to do. Now, let me go back to that time when we went back to that uh, one, of the, one of the ball games we went to. I'm not a big sports fan, but you don't have to be a sports fan to have your favorite star, right? And so I can still remember we went to a ball game, and, you know, the, the music started playing, and there were some fireworks, and here comes the team trotting out onto the field. And so here we are, I, I, I'm up on my seat and I'm trying to look as they're coming out of the tunnel to see if I can see the, one, the, the, you know, the players that I might recognize in the flesh. And I, I wasn't seeing anybody from that distance, but I just happened to look up, you know, in the, the middle of the arena or whatever. Was, they got this great big, uh, what do they call that? Jumbotron. Say it, Jumbotron? Yeah. I, I look up at the Jumbotron and here, not only was it somebody that I knew, I mean, that I, that I, um, that, that I knew was playing, but it's somebody that I met personally. And you know what? There he is. He's not coming out of the tunnel. He's in the crowd, but he's not just with any crowd. He's down with this group of handicapped children, high five and all. And all I can tell you is, man, I was captivated. He got my attention. I couldn't take my eyes off the screen after I saw that. Because here's a man. I mean, this, this man, I mean, you think about this, most of these sports guys, they don't have any time for nobody else, at least it seems. All they are is about the game, but not this man. Angels are on the edge of their seat right now. Why? Because they don't want to miss anything that's going on right now. If you, listen, if, if, if you're one of God's creatures, one of his creation, he, listen, he is... He has inspired them to be watching what we're doing. They see what salvation does. Listen to this. It's amazing. It's incredible. It's stupendous. Look at what the grace of God, look at what the work of Jesus on the cross did to selfish, sinful people. So they're looking at this and oh my. I can't hardly believe. Can you imagine they're looking intently on what God has done for those selfish people? So like us, they stand on tiptoe to get a better view. When they want to see even more, what do they do? They stoop down and then they bend over. As if to, to position themselves to get a better vantage point. As if peering over heaven to see the unfolding plan of salvation in our lives and in the world. I was told, uh, it might have been Brother Mike, that I should go experience the Creation Museum. Did you guys go there? You did. So it's a, I think it's a, someplace in Kentucky. Do you know about it? Yeah. But here to think, apparently the museum is, is organized around the letter C. And let me give it to you. The letter C is used to show salvation narrative that weaves through scripture. Here it is. The first C creation, the second C was corruption. The next C is catastrophe. The next C is confusion. Then Christ, then the cross, and then consummation. But I would also add two more C's if I were to reorganize the, or the, the museum. Uh, how about God's chosen people, the chosen people, the chosen ones? 
and the church. Here are four angelic episodes when angels looked to see God's unfolding plan. Job chapter 38, verse 7. The angels sang at creation. That's what we see. That's what we read. When God created the world, we know from that particular verse that the angels rejoiced. As the morning stars sang together, and all the angels shouted, shouted for joy at the creation of the world. And then we see again that angels announced the birth of Jesus. Some of us, we know that story. We hear it at least once a year. Amen. I mean, the, the, the skies, according to the scripture, the skies are filled with angelic messengers as they leaned in and they delivered that divine birth announcement in Luke chapter 2. And it says, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. But then okay, the angels bust out in praises around the throne in Revelation chapter 5, verse 11 and 12. It said, Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Amen. And then we see the angels, they throw a party. They throw a party every time when somebody becomes part of that new creation. Yes. Luke chapter 15, verse 10. Likewise, I say to you that there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Yes. So here's the question. Since the prophets predicted the apostles proclaimed. The angels prize that salvation. How can you be bored with it? How in the world could you be bored with it? I wonder what angels think when we live half-hearted, spiritually sleepy lives. I wonder what they really think and how what they really feel about how we conduct ourselves. Some of us, we come and we put on our best when we come to church. We go out there in the world, whether at the workplace or wherever, and we're just like the rest of the world. You join, sometimes you join right in. You join into the, the negativity and say, well, it's, it's, it's not just negative, Pastor, it's true. No, wait, listen. You can't fixate on those things. In the, in the darkest times, you want to know what you need? You need to be encouraged by the Lord. And sometimes you may have to encourage yourself in the Lord. Amen. And did you know that if you encourage yourself and you do it out loud, you probably ought to encourage somebody next to you. Amen. That's one of the reasons we gather, you know. Did you know what happens when we get together? We get to, we grow. Remember the gathering, the growing, the giving, the going. When we, when we gather together, we grow. Why do we grow? Because we encourage one another. But I, listen, for me, I'm encouraged today because I get to see your smiling faces this morning. Amen. Especially mine. Um, but how is it that we can be so bored with it? What must they think when people outright ignore salvation? Oh, you'll ask them, say, well, are you? yeah, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved. Well, why is it that you live your life as if you're ignoring the fact that you are a child of God that you're redeemed. How is it that you can continue to live your life the way you did before Jesus? Apparently, you want to keep the garbage. Or as Paul said, you like the dumb. I don't know about you, but if I get it on me, I want it off. Amen? Amen. All I can say is that angels must ache when they see us filled with bitterness, when they see us sitting on the sidelines, when they see us not being able to get along together as God would have us to work together, supplying what everyone needs. And then when we don't recognize, so get this, because there's, there's something. Here, let, me, let me give you this this morning. We are to be able to provide what everyone needs, but there is an expectation and a limitation. Because I can tell you that there are groups of people that get together and there's a limit to what they can provide. So what should we do? Let's see. 
gather, grow, give. You might want to go. Go do what? Go get some more people. Go share the love of God with some more people. Go get, I'm not, listen, I'm telling you this morning, when we go out there, that's what we're supposed to be doing. Because the number one reason you're doing it is because they need Jesus every bit as much as you do. Nobody needs it more or less. Everybody, we all need it the same. And if you're here this morning and you think you need it less than the next person, you are in a world of trouble. And the angels right now are saying, how can this be? And maybe you're going through some hard times. I, have, I understand hard times. I know what that looks like. Friends, when you're suffering, when you're going through dark times, when you, when, when you feel like your world is falling apart, what I want you to hear this morning is this. You need to set up bead. You need to set your crosshairs. You need to lock in on salvation. You need to lock in on your salvation. Because the problem is that many times we just forget. Many times we get distracted. And that's one reason why in this list of uh, the list of G is the gathering part. That first G, gather. We gather, we grow, we give, and we go. We gather with God's people so we don't forget what salvation is all about. When you don't gather, I promise you, most of the folks who are not gathering regularly, they have forgotten. Or maybe, you know what, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. They never knew what salvation was truly all about. Somebody told them, listen, it's all about you. If you were the only one, Jesus would die for you. There is, what's this, some truth to that. Is it, am I right? There's some truth to that. But the greater truth is he didn't die just for you, and he didn't save you just for your sake. He saved you for good works. Amen. And he says, the things that I did, you need to go and do them likewise. Tell your neighbors about me. And today, we have this absolutely awesome opportunity to do something. It's an incredible privilege to gather together. Earlier on, we, we shared how Jesus said he desired to eat that meal. Matter of fact, it was so desired, he said he was, it was desirable to eat that meal. Kind of in, double, double hit that word to give you great impact. And today, we gather to remember the Lord's Supper. But there are three things that we need to take care of before we commune together for communion. Number one, I think this is probably in your bulletin. Make sure you're saved. I mean, you can take care of that right now. It's not hard. But after you get up and leave out of here, it may not be easy. We shouldn't take it so lightly. See, we have to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And, and I think I, I probably commented here recently, but a thought came to me. If you expect heaven, those who expect heaven probably fall into hell. Because we have a sense of entitlement. I'm entitled to heaven. You're not entitled to anything. But those who quite often were maybe be surprised. Look, Mike, I'll, I'll be surprised maybe if I make it to heaven. I say, what? I'll be more than surprised. I'll be overjoyed. I mean, I am surprised every day. So what am I telling you? Every day, I have to say this. I want to give you the short version because in the interest of time. Father, forgive me. A sinner. Amen. Every day. Many of us, we have this attitude and we don't, Father, don't look at me a sinner. No, wait. No, Father, forgive me a sinner. And, that, and what you know what you're doing at that point? You're calling attention to yourself. 
And I have gone through some times in my life, and I thank God for people that I can call. I mean, there's there's a, a few here today that, who knows, you, you might not be completely surprised. I may have to call you and say, hey, I'm struggling with something. I need you. Why? Because the Bible says we should confess our faults, our weaknesses. What, remember that gathering and growing? This is part of the growing. Anybody here have any struggle with weakness? Yeah. You got areas in your life that you still deal with? Yeah. Bitterness? Yes. <clears throat> maybe, maybe there's other things. Maybe, uh, may, maybe you have trouble with your desire. Maybe you've got wandering eyes or a wandering heart. Be sure that you're saved. Matter of fact, pray this with me. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for what you've done for me. I don't take it lightly. Father God, I speak in the name of your Son who died for my sins. Forgive me, a sinner. Send your Spirit to me today and overwhelm me with your presence that I might walk in a manner worthy of repentance. I want to turn away from these sinful things and I want to turn away to all those things that are holy in Christ Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. So number one, make sure you're saved. Number two, this is for every one of us because it leads to sin. Confess your spiritual boredom. One apologist said this, when a man is bored with God, even heaven does not have any alternative. Did you hear what I said? When a man is bored with God and the things of God, I'll add that, even heaven doesn't have a better alternative. We sit back and we're saying things, well, you know, I, I don't know what happened, but I just, it just doesn't do it for me. You might want to grow up in your faith. You know, I don't remember the days, but I can remember if, because people told me, my mommy used to feed me. She does pretty good today, but she doesn't have to chew the food for me or anything like that. But she does fix a pretty good meal. And she did recently cut my meat for me. <laughs> then I found that's because she wanted to taste. There you go. But then I realized she was tasting this. She said, see, it is good. But you hear what I'm saying? There are things you need to do for yourself. And I promise you this from my own experience, Mother Mike and Sarah, Sister Amanda, and others should say the same thing. Maybe it doesn't do anything for you, but I'll bet if you did something for it, it would be reciprocal. If you could ask God this morning, say, God, restore the joy of my salvation. But listen, in Luke chapter 10, Jesus wanted to shake up some religious folks. And they were all they were all pent up and all held up in their rituals. And so that, that they would be in awe of, of what was right in front of them. Listen to what he says. For I tell you that many prophets and kings had desired to see what you see. And have not seen it. And to hear what you hear. And have not heard it. Friend, if you know Jesus, you now know what the prophets never knew. And you now know what the angels wish they knew. So if you're sitting back, whether you're here this morning, whether you're at home, whether it's today or some other day in the future you hear this message, you need to get back where you belong in your walk with the Lord. So number one, make sure you're saved. Number two, confess your boredom. Number three, I've said this so many times this morning, I'm going to say it again. Ask God to restore the joy of your salvation. But I've got to tell you, you need to show up. Just to be clear, not just for myself, but how many right now are encouraged just to see people in the house of God today? Amen. And it adds to your joy. Yes. And it's not just your salvation anymore. No. You see, we've forgotten what salvation is. It's not just for me. It's not even just for me and mine. But it's for all those 
who would come. Are you hearing me? Yes. Yes. All those who would come if he would come. The prophets were predicting, the apostles were preaching, and the angels are prizing, and that all comes together at the Lord's table. Yes. Amen. During the Renaissance, there was a painter by the name of Tarantino, uh, uh, Tintorino, Loretto, there we go. Uh, I just crucified his name, Tintorino. I said it right once. I'm not going to try it again. He created a picture of the Last Supper. Let's see if I got that up here. If I get my work right. Let's I don't know how well you can see this back there. I saw this. Came up, uh, came up on some website I was on. It's kind of, I said, what, what is that? So I had to do a little searching. But it's a version of The Last Supper. And in this version, it depicts a scene from above looking down on Jesus and the disciples. It was kind of a, it was a, on a big screen, on a white computer screen. You see this up here, you see the angels looking down at what Jesus was doing at that last supper. It appears that Jesus has just said, this is my body and this is my blood. And the disciples have looks on their faces as if they're trying to figure everything out. What does this all mean? And the angels are, they're looking over, they're peering over heaven, and they're looking down, and, and they're wondering, what is this that we're seeing? What is this spectacle? What is going on? They're seeing salvation as it's beginning to unfold right before their eyes. They're seeing salvation for those selfish, lazy people. But they see it unfolding as Jesus is going to go to the cross. So above the table, angels are watching what's happening. Their faces are showing this curiosity. Their faces are showing this, this interest as they marvel at what Jesus is preparing to do. So this morning, as we prepare for communion, I wonder if once again we could be stunned. I wonder if once again we could just... Be Restore the joy of our salvation. And I want to say the mystery and that desire to want more. How many of you want more of what God has for you? <clears throat> so I'm going to ask um, Sister Linda, as I, to, as I quite often do, she would come up this morning. And my wife. And as she's coming around, she's going, they're going to serve the table as it was. This morning, you all, how many of y'all prayed with me this morning? Amen. Just to be clear, a, a prayer does not in itself make you saved. Amen. But you have spoken the words. If you take it to heart. If you're considering the implication of what Jesus has done and what he's doing right now, I want you to take the elements of the sacrament this morning. Hang on to it because we're going to receive it all together.
I was just thinking about the day when Jesus was there and as the women were serving the tables. I wonder if which one was Martha and which one was Thank you, ladies. That's your nice hand. From the scripture we read, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 and 28. And if you can just close your eyes and just imagine being there. And Paul is talking about this day. He says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, in the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the wounded body of our Savior. And in the same manner, he also took a cup of, after supper, saying, This is a cup. It is a new covenant of my blood. This do as often as you drink. Do that in remembrance of me. Jesus will remember in your blood that was poured for us. Amen. trust. 
my shield, the horn of my salvation, and my refuge, you are worthy of praise. I will call upon the Lord, and so shall I be saved from my friend's enemies. He delivered me from the strong enemies, and from those who hated me. For they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my disaster. But, but the, the Lord, Lord was, my, was my, my support. Lord was my support. He brought me out of the open places. He rescued me because he invited me. Jesus, Savior of the world, come, come to us in your mercy. Father, we thank you today. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being able to be here. And Lord, again, may your word that has been sown out find hearts, fertile soil, that it might grow. As we turn to look towards you, Jesus, as the song says, looking full at your wonderful face, Lord, let all the things of the earth grow strangely near to the light of the glory and grace. Father, it is your glory, it is your grace that we seek. We recognize the days in which we live, and we thank you, God, and as we turn our eyes towards you, we realize that you've always been watching towards us. Yes. Thank you, God. Strengthen each and every one that is here this morning. And Lord, our, our individually and our, our corporate struggles that we go through, Lord, strengthen us together as we grow. In Jesus' name. In Jesus. And the church all said, Amen. Amen. Sister Linda. I thank God for the word today. I thank God for the ministering angels he has over us. Yes. And I feel like right now, I need a lot of them. So I'm looking yes. to those angels, but I'm most of all looking to God. And, I, you know, it's just hit me this week. I, and I don't mean to keep holding everybody along, but when it's in there, it's got to come out, right? Yes. Pastor said so today, right? <laughs> so, but I know that Jesus is an intercessor. But I've read in the scriptures, Jesus is praying for me. Hallelujah. Who could you want better to pray for you? So he's living so that example for us, for him to do that for us. But Father, how See, much more should we be praying for each other, right? Amen. So I desire your prayers. I thank you for your time today. And I ask, Lord, that, that you stay for fellowship. Everybody, we're having pulled pork and finger foods, whatever yes. else. So it's good food and you know, God's going to bless it. We thank the Lord for all those that brought us. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love and your mercy. We thank you, O oh God, that we know that you have ministry angels over us. But most of all, you're over us, O oh God. You created the angels, Lord, to protect us and watch over and lead and guide us. And Lord, your son, how much we love him or we want to love him and follow his example in his ministry and sharing and giving and going. He even went to the Father's house. We thank you, O oh God, for the example that he has set before us. And we ask, Lord, you just move in our lives today. Keep us all safe and well so we go our separate ways, Lord. And we ask that your will be done in and through our hearts and bless our fellowship now as we proceed to go next door, Father. Your will be done and bless all those, dear God, that had their hands in preparing the foods today and those that have brought to donate. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.